And we are live this Monday, March 9th, 2015, for a very special Responsible Travel and Wildlife Conservation on the Social Web Hangout. And uh, very good greetings to everybody, uh, friends in South Africa. And we are doing, a, hopefully, a, a Monday Hangout on this topic. Can you introduce yourselves? And we're happy to see you both. I'm a book. Martin? <laughs> I'm a book. <laughs> I'm Martin Hatchell. I'm a tourism communications consultant, qualified horticulturist, and, uh, and the owner of a first edition of the Mammals of the Southern African Sub region by Ray Smithers. When I was a young man, I had to save up for months and months to buy my very favorite book. Good afternoon to you, Ron and Greg. Hi, Martin. Hi, Ron. Nice to be back with you again. Um, I'm CEO of Nasna Tourism, and uh, a, I believe I'm a conservation ethicist and a conservation tourism specialist, and uh, responsible tourism is very close to my heart. How so? How so, Greg? Say again. How so? How's How's, how's conservation close to your um, Well, I said, um, my, sorry, I said responsible tourism is very close to my heart. Yeah, I don't know if that is, yeah, responsible tourism is very close to my heart. And, um, and then again, um, in Neisner, we've got a very, very, very sensitive area. We live within a, um, within a national park. And um, we have to learn how, what the real deep issues of responsible tourism are. Um, the, the slightest mismanagement of our system will result in, in the very system we reside in uh, losing its value. Beautiful. Rod, you, you, you seem to be confused about where we live. Try to bring this map up. Um. <laughs> That's the map of Africa. Okay, that's the southern tip of Africa. Right, so on the bottom section of the southern tip of Africa, on that flat section you can see down there, we're round about in the middle. Uh, about, what's it, 12 hours flying time from London? If you add the two together, flying to Johannesburg and flying from Johannesburg to London. So to give you an idea of how long Africa is. I was going to say, how close and, uh, are you folks to Antarctica? Uh, no, not at all. We're on, we're on the 34th parallel, 34 degrees south. And the area that we live in uh, is the only part of sub-Saharan Africa that is all year round rainfall. And it is uh, known for its, its uh, forests, its evergreen um, Afro-Montane forest, the Neisner forest. And the landscape here is very beautiful. Is uh, um, uh, as a result, uh, about 160,000 hectares of the area that we live in is the Garden Route National Park, and uh, it is the only unfenced national park in South Africa. So, literally, I go down to the uh, estuary at the uh, at the end of this conversation to take my dog for a walk, and I step into the national park. It's a uh, uh, the, the the boundaries of are are defined, but they but they are loose. If you understand what I mean, you probably don't. But so um, yeah, we're working Greg, on it. <laughs> uh, Greg and I have served together on the same committees and boards, uh, marketing this area, and I think uh, I can speak for us both when I say that over the last five or ten years, because of our changes in our family situation, we've started to understand what it is that we're going to be leaving to our children and uh, we've both become very um, keen supporters of the idea of responsible travel which is making better places to live in and better places to visit. Beautiful. Greg, any additions? Yeah, it's, I think Martin summed it up. Uh, the only bit I can add is um, an interesting dynamic is that I think that we are also host to that system where Martin said there are no fences and in our forest there are elephants or an elephant or let's say elephants living there, wild elephants 
uh, within that, that uh, large area of national park where there are no fences. Um, and I think those elephants represent a dynamic that um, is very interesting and provides for interesting debate. It is indeed because um, the elephants have been much studied, uh, but, uh, well, people have tried to study it with, without a lot of success because they are so secretive. They um, literally blend into the forest. I have been in the presence of an elephant that's moved 10 meters off from me to enter the forest and lost sight of the elephant. And I mean, you know, even you, Ron, would know how big an elephant is. Um, oh, wait a second. I'm, I'm just thinking, so the entire concept of elephant in the room is a great big misnomer? It is an enormous misnomer. <laughs> Where? Where? <laughs> but yeah, no, the elephant in the room can be quite, it can be incredibly secretive. And what Greg is saying, I think, is that they represent for us the dynamic between man and um, and wildlife, because they are there, and so often in our area, we're not even aware that they are within meters of where we are. Although I must say, I kind of give you the idea that there's elephants running down the streets. They aren't. You have to go deep into the forests to experience them, and very few people have had the, have had the fortune fortune have been fortunate enough to actually meet the wild nice elephants. But it is the southernmost bird and, and, the, and the only one uh, that is living in an, uh, in an unfenced, uh, unfenced reserve. So from time to time there's, um, react there's interaction between elephants and man. When an elephant is in Musk, uh, a couple of years ago it destroyed some metal signage and turned over uh, um, some, some earth-moving machine. Uh, well, not earth moving, one of those big machines that they use for moving big logs. It actually turned it over. So we, have these, we have these elephant... Um, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think just to add to that, Martin, you're speaking about elephants and it wasn't such a long time ago that the, um, the community here lived and, and still does to a lesser degree, but they lived um, side by side with this herd, but at the same time, we've got species like Orochrysops niobe, the, the butterfly, um, and it's uh, the reserve, the, the Brenton Blue Butterfly Reserve is an area of about half the size of a football field, and it represents one of the smaller species, um, one of the indicator species, um, that we that reside and, and live in our area. Now, we as a community have to live responsibly, a collective community. There's no, it's not the rich that have to live differently. We all collectively have to understand these broad principles. And the elephant is an easy one. It's a big thing and, you know, people over the years have shot them out and they've learned to live secretively in the forest. Um, and they, they represent a story um, that is very different to the Brenton Blue Butterfly. And Dave Edge was telling me that this is the guy that went through the whole journey of, of driving the process where the Brenton Blue Butter, Butterfly Reserve became um, effective. He was describing the other day that the Brenton Blue Butterfly Reserve carries a higher conservation status than the Kruger Park. And I'm looking forward to, to defining that in more detail so that students of responsible tourism can understand it. What does it mean to, to sustain that reserve? That's a red delta species. If they disappear, they've gone for life. But what does that actually mean to us as a community? And there are other indicator species. There, there are Hippocampus capensis. There are, um, you know, there's a number of them that, that our lives and the, the sustainable way, the responsible manner within which we live our lives determines their livelihood. I want, to take, I want to ask you both to take me back in time a bit. Um, you talk about this butterfly reserve. I assume it's less than 30 years old or 50 years old. And the question I have is... Early 1990s, if I remember correctly, Greg. 
uh, so, proclaimed in around about 90, it was Pella Jordan's era. Um, so I think it was about 97, 98. And what was just after the, the creation? Or was it a response to? It was a well, response to the understanding that the, uh, the, the, this Brenton Blue butterfly lives only in a very small area. And uh, and if that uh, half hectare, the size of a soccer field, basically a football field, if that area was destroyed, we would lose the species. So it was uh, a, a response to that to an understanding that we were in the danger of losing the species. And in order to pre to preserve the species, they preserved the land. Oh, thank you, Martin. Go, Greg, your your thoughts? Well, basically, um, when one looks at the brand, the the naturally Nisner brand and one looks at the core values and addresses the core values of the brand, that only becomes meaningful when the broader community of Nisner citizens understand what it means. And that leads directly to responsible tourism. When, when we speak about responsible tourism, very often we re, we're speaking about um, a project. Um, we not, how often do we actually address an entire group of people, um, an entire social n community having to abide by the core values of the, of the, the brand to ensure the longevity of indicator species or red data species. It's kind of, I, I want to thank you both for, for, for those thoughts on, on the creation. Uh, I guess my question and the story that I was kind of seeking was, you know, what changed in the in the nineties for you that was the impetus for this? Or have you had like this continual two hundred year history of conservation or you know, what's a recent timeline of the past uh, twenty or fifty years or a hundred or or hundred and fifty thousand, but we'll get to that later. Okay. I think I can I think I can answer that now. I understand your question. In the uh, early 1800s, the most important, um, okay, first of all, the Cape Colony was settled by Europeans from, you know, permanently from the 1700s, perhaps a little earlier. My dates are not very good. Uh, but by the time the early 1800s rolled around, the, the big settlement was at Cape Town. Um, the the uh, um, Dutch were there first, and then the British took over, and the raw material that was in most demand was timber. And it was, in the early 1800s, uh, they, they started harvesting timber in the Nisner area. It was kind of a, a, a settling start. The Nisner area being the Garden Rick, the South Cape, uh, the, I mean, this, this, this southern uh, coast of South Africa. It was kind of a stuttering, stuttering start, but by the middle of that 19th century, we were going at it hammer and tongs. The, 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 the researchers believed that there were probably about 250,000 hectares of uh, natural forest here at the beginning of the 1800s. In 1869, there was a massive fire, uh, a bushfire, which uh, devastated huge areas of the coast and which actually wiped out all the grassland um, in this section of the coast between the Indian Ocean and the Otanikwa Mountains, which is the um, mountains that separate us from the semi-arid interior. And um, the tree felling continued until the early 1900s, at which stage people started to realize that the forest couldn't supply timber forever. And in fact, in the in the late 1800s, they uh, brought in uh, people, particularly a, a, a forester from France, whose name escapes me at the moment, who started trying to put some conservation methods into place. By the early 1900s, they realized that they needed to take more drastic action, and both for environmental and for political reasons, that they should stop cutting the natural timber from this area. And um, they started plantation forestry and they um, 
phased out the, the felling of the natural timber. And then in the, by, the, by the 1920s, they left the forest to rest. And it wasn't open for harvesting until well into the 1960s. The result was that the forest was able to re re regenerate itself. And we've got something like, I think it's 65,000 hectares of forest left today, which is conservation forest uh, and small, 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 but I mean really small quantities of tree, uh, of timber are, are taken out of the forest. Those are the, ex the, the kind of expensive timbers like uh, things like stinkwood and yellowwood, um, which are the, the two very famous timbers that have come from this forest. So from the 1920s, conservation has been quite seriously applied in this area. Well, in the second, 19 wait, 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 wait. Before, we, uh, before we get to that, um, yeah. we're looking at this website. Can you tell us a little bit about this website? And then, I'm getting and to then, that. Okay. Okay, I, I'm going to get there. In the 1960s, they developed a really strong environmental ethic and a huge number of scientific, uh, a huge amount of scientific research just took place over the next 20 or 30 years. But also the people of the area started to become aware of the need for conservation. In the early 1990s, some people on the, um, in the, in the uh, Brenton area, which is uh, across the estuary from where I live uh, and, and overlooking the, the Indian Ocean, realized that this Brenton blue butterfly, which is on this page, okay, perhaps I should stop because you've been looking at it for too long. They realized that this butterfly was, uh, was only shown, uh, only occurred in this one small area. And Greg's used the word um, indicator species. It is an indicator of the health of the environment. Without a species like that, we know that the environment's on its way out. The landscape, the natural landscape. And some local residents um, did a, um, a they, they put a campaign together. They got uh, the government on board, and uh, in the mid '90s, they um, declared that a nature, uh, a nature reserve, a, a nature preserve. It's actually an area that you're not allowed to enter. Is am I correct, Greg? Well, there's little parts, and and you can go and engage with it. Yeah. Um, and the, uh, but some some significance. If you look at the timeline that Martin has just described, back in the 1800s, um, if we take the, the area between Cape Town and Port Elizabeth, which was all of 750 kilometers, it was wildlife rich. It had pretty much every species um, as 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 people know when they go on safaris. Um, and elephants, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of elephants. And you know, Addo Elephant National Park is a well-known national park. Um, and the significance of what Martin has described is it was only 150 years, 200 years ago, that this area was had an abundance of wildlife, including the small species which we've just which have just been described. Today. Um, when tourists or visitors come to South Africa, they want to see the Big Five. And they, how do these little species like the Brenton Blue compete with the Big, the big Five species, the leopard, and what National Geographic is showing on television? When, when in effect, what is going to save um, the, the, the sensitivity in the natural space is, is actually these, the, the, the longevity and the lifestyle of, of people in the area, which is supported by tourism. Um, and we compete against places which um, sell the big five as a commodity. So it's, when we started the conversation about responsible tourism, I consistently hear people referring to responsible tourism projects. I have not as yet seen or identified or witnessed or experienced people talking about the brand 
as a as a responsible effort of an entire community. I don't know if you have, Martin. No, I haven't. Uh, there are some there are some uh, commercial um, facilities like um, uh, uh, help me, Greg, uh, the the uh, um, which where where the whole um, company lives a responsible tourism lifestyle. Well, wait, wait, a a second, wait a second. Wait a second. Both of you. Um, I want to address. I want to address. I want to get, keep that thought in your head, but I want to keep. Um, I want to show you one of the lessons learned just today from a Twitter account called Pour Me Coffee, and I think if you are, if you are uh, promoting the smaller parks of the world, you have to find the endemic uh, species that are really uh, attractive, and you know Horn Church County Country Park. You know, as we know, the home of the woodpecker riding weasel. Mm. Uh, you just can't get publicity like that. No, you can't. Ron, can, can <laughs> I? I'm still waving my book on, uh, around. Um, the, the mammals of the southern African subregion has something like 300 and, 300 and something species in it, including the big five. The big five, we, we've discussed this before. There are moral problems with, with the idea of marketing the big five. But I want to show you something else here. This, I have quite a large collection of books about wildlife in South Africa. It, it's one of my, and this is the succulent flora of Southern Africa by uh, Doreen Court, a revised edition. Um, have a look. I mean, there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different types of the most interesting, intricate, and unusual Plants. That's just one group of plants. That's just the plants with the with whose leaves are reduced to. Oh, we love uh, we love our succulents. Come on, everybody loves succulents. Who doesn't love a succulent? But you know, my question loves is goes back to using but the technology. So my question is always going back to the technology, and that is how do we get people to put their Instagram photos of of native flora online and either know the answer or ask, hey, what what tree is this? Well, I'm, I'm a member of, of, of a Facebook group called uh, Plant Idents, and I would uh, strongly recommend anybody joins that because I've never, ever, ever put a picture on, on Plant Idents and not got an answer within the next half an hour. But the point that I'm trying to make, Ron, I know you're very keen on, on, on social web and sharing and, uh, and engagement. This is our, this is our new library. Old library, new library. Uh, this space for this place for both, but the point I'm trying to make is that we have, and we've spoken about this in our last hangout. We have the big fifty thousand. There's so much to market here. We have cute little furries. We have big and 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 we have the the the, the really elegant tinies like the Brenton blue butterfly, um, and the nice the seals. Which is which is a fish that occurs only in our estuary. So the uh, onus is on people like Craig and myself, I think, to make people aware of uh, the fact that there is so much more to South Africa than just five species of animals, and that I'm talking about South Africa's wildlife, and that. If you want to see the destination, you need to engage with, with, with the wildlife uh, as much as you need to engage with the people. And that in order for, to, for us to be able to have, a, a, to leave a destination to our children, Greg has younger children, I have a grandchild, to be able to leave a, the destination to them in a more than satisfactory condition, we need responsible travel so that we stop damaging the environment through tourism. Anna Pollock put it very well. We need to change the industrial model of tourism. Tourism needs to go back to being travel and human and, and about interactions between humans and the environment. And what okay. it's, it's a holistic, it's holistic. Um, if, a, if an entire town or if an entire region is not living the brand, hmm. Um, you've got very little chance of one or two, the critical mass or the tipping point 
of a few products, the, the crude bosses or the Inverushes or those people, you, you have to have a critical mass of people living a lifestyle that is res that is responsible to, to have a benefit on the entire community. And that's why I often refer to this Greater Nisner area as an outdoor classroom. You know, there's some universities that come out and teach uh, the principles of uh, sustainable resource management here because all the examples are within a very, very short um, space of each other. Um, you, you have a national park. I think they, they refer to it in terms of space. Um, you can manage your little garden as well as possible, but if your neighbors aren't replicating those principles, you may as well move, move out the area. So I come back to the principles of responsible tourism and the, the various the discussions and the debates and, the, and everything that's taking place. And I don't see the proper foundations out there. I don't hear the collective conversation uh, that I believe I should be hearing. And Martin, you can be you can be critical in this. You know, you can be the critic here, but I don't. Uh, I'm known to call a spade a shovel, uh, or to say it as it is. And um, I really do not believe that the real conversation has been had. I think it's been commercialized. I think ecotourism, the words ecotourism, responsible travel, responsible tourism. Um, I think they're all becoming. Uh, just another commercial additive, um, and we're losing the, the the foundations. And how do we get back to what it really means? Greg, you saw me getting so excited. I, I've got really great news today. Um, Greg, I totally agree with you. I think that people are not equipped uh, as consumers to know what responsible travel is, and people are not equipped as uh, as as tourism. Um, experience owners, whether that's adventures or accommodation, to, to know how to offer responsible travel. The conversation is very important. The education is very important. The um, idea of examining the ethics is very important. And just today, I met with the CEO of Muscle Bay Tourism, and we are going to be announcing this week, well, I'm announcing it here tonight. On the 29th of May, Mossel Bay is going to present its Engage RT conference, Engage with Responsible Tourism, Responsible Travel, as part of its Travel Mossel Bay Festival. And we're going to have, hopefully, an international discussion so about the, the, the date. Huh? That's the day. We're going to have hopefully an international discussion about responsible travel and what makes it so different is that we are funded by um, taxpayers money so we don't have to make a, a, a profit and we are going to be opening this conference to everybody who has access to YouTube and Twitter so there will be a room uh, we will be having a conference in a room but hopefully um, Alistair uh, Mackenzie in England and and Ron Marda in, in Nevada. I love that Ron Marda in Nevada. I should be a poet. And possibly somebody from Australia and so on will be able to speak as speakers of the conference, beamed into the room through YouTube, and then uh, people who watch will either then or later will be able to join in the conversation. And what we want to do, because we said from the day we founded Mossel Bay, uh, Travel Mossel Bay, we want to use it to um, to further the cause of responsible travel. And what we want to do is we want to open it up. We want engagement. And I think engagement, and it's Ron's favorite word, engagement is the uh, step at which we begin to answer the questions that frustrate you so much. So that's uh, Engage RT, Muscle Bay Tourism's Engage RT, international conference from a tiny little town of 130,000 people on the southern tip of Africa, which will hopefully start the, uh, you know the famous thing, the, the, uh, the butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the world, you get a typhoon on the other. We hope, we hope that we'll be able to do that. And I know Ron's going to be involved, and uh, I sincerely hope that you're going to be involved in that. Greg. 
Sounds exciting. Okay. While, I'm Sounds exciting. Okay. while I'm punting it, uh, the website is www.visitmusclebay.co.za. Well, make sure you timestamp that. Um, yeah. I w want to just reflect <laughs> briefly uh, on both of you. And Martin, first, uh, congratulations on the Visit, Visit Mossel Bay event. Sounds wonderful. I know you streamed the last one, so I can't wait to see what happens this time. To me, live streaming conferences is one way of making sure that at least the event is, uh, is inclusive. When you can add outside people as speakers or as outside questioners, in other words, you solicit questions from that online audience, you really have transformed that, that one-room conversation into a global discussion. And it might be, you know, a very limited global discussion. You know, I don't know if we had, I don't know if we can arrange uh, the Visit Mossel Bay Conference viewing party here in Las Vegas. But at some point, that'll be a reality where you make uh, a local event in South Africa and then you find your allies and say, can you join us, if only as, uh, as um, pretext, for offering a, a you know a cocktail meet and greet networking event, uh, there are ways. That, to, there are ways. So many ways we can connect. We have uh, we have um, uh, we are busy negotiating a, a, an alliance with a tour operator in Kentucky, uh, and that's a very good idea that you've just said. Uh, maybe he can uh, get some of his clients together in his town uh, and. View some of our presentations. That's the way. That's the, that's. You know, you know, think about it from the perspective of someone over here on the other side of the Atlantic. All we really know about South Africa comes from Chappie and District Nine. And if you're not being overrun by marauding police robots, you're being attacked by alien cities establishing cities and you know slums in the sky. You know, that's our view of South Africa. So anything else that can deepen. Our knowledge is uh, most appreciated. You need to think about learning about South Africa, Ron, um, uh, because you come from South Africa. Um, I don't know if you can see this. I was so excited with the results of our meeting that I, when I walked out, I walked past a bookshop and they were having a sale, and I bought this as myself as the gift. Um, born in Africa. It is Martin Meredith's book uh, about the uh, quest for the origins of human life, and it's mostly about the, re the politics between the different paleontologists. But Darwin proposed that man probably came from Africa, and the research over the last hundred years has shown that, it, that, 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 that man, everybody came from Africa. We emigrated out, well, not we, but people emigrated out of Africa about 60,000 years ago and populated the world relatively quickly. Um, but yeah, so South Africa is, we've got a lot to offer. And, Greg, uh, and, and, and not only from a wildlife perspective as well. Greg, get in there. Yeah, I'm listening to this. Uh, Martin's on a roll today. I, I, I'm just, uh, you know, this ground squirrel of his, um, of the wisdom he's, he's springing forth today. I mean, you know, I'm just in awe of it. But Martin, I think what we've done is we've captured the essence of um, the, the conversation, the responsible com uh, tourism conversation. But I'm going to keep on asking for, the, for evidence of the conversion. I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm not saying, I think you know where I'm coming from when I say lip service. I need to see it's yeah. embedded. It's almost, I'm not seeing it as a basic teaching. But then again, if we look at the past 20 years of um, what we've known tourism to be, most of the people in tourism are not tourism practitioners. They haven't gone to the School of Tourism. And, and this leads to a conversation that Martin and I have had extensively about creating the right foundation to, to teaching uh, what they're not teaching at the School of Tourism, which I, I must say, I must go and, f uh, you know, I've, I've lectured at, a, at many different places, and I'm not seeing the content that should be there. Um, it's lip service, and I, again, I come back to our area of the garden route, and it is an amazing outdoor classroom where 
which is also a form of tourism. It's it's the conservation, it's the the um, it, the knowledge economy, and um, you know, out, out of these discussions, I'd like to see us reaching out to universities, and I'd like to see us challenging those uh, academic centres that profess to teach tourism and responsible tourism. I back you 100% there. I think uh, we need to we need to keep asking that question. I've in the past been sent tourism textbooks to review, and it's all about uh, silver service and how to uh, you know how to put the fish on somebody's plate, but it's got nothing to do with how did the fish get into the kitchen in the first place, and whether or not that that fish is uh, whether or not it's 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 appropriate to eat that fish to catch it in the first place, whether the mm. stocks are sustainable. So I I support you a hundred percent in in what you're saying. That that is the 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 one of the things that we we really have to do. We have to keep and you have to keep asking that question. Well, you know what's interesting. But, just to interrupt you both. Uh, oh, sorry, Greg. But just to interrupt you both. This is Open Education Week, which is now I think in its third or fourth or fifth year. You can tell how well I keep track of time, but uh, it's a fairly new uh, event that takes place all around the world that promotes the open access to educational materials. Again, as taxpayers paying public institutions, um, isn't it a little bit ironic, if not sad, that they, the academic publishing model is that the researchers publish something in a journal that then costs several hundred dollars a year for a library, instead of making that information open in a much more timely and, and accessible manner. And we see magazines such as PLOS One, PLOS, PLOS One, uh, publish some of the most uh, groundbreaking materials and making sure that it's available so that you can cite it, you can quote it, you can copy it, uh, you can translate it. In other words, it's making that information much more available. And so and much of the open the education movement comes from Cape Town. It's the declaration. It's, one of, it's my favorite declaration from Cape Town. It's about open education. So... I agree with you, Greg, and I want to get back to you, but we're not having the conversations we need to have. It's one of the reasons that I've kind of abandoned public speaking unless there are some leniences for being controversial and provocative, not just to be provocative, but to ask some of these important questions. And when you get into academia, uh, I'll, side with, I'll, I'll agree with both of you, there are far too many abstract, there are far too many abstract discussions of theories in competition with, an, well, with one another than, ask, than asking the locals, well, what do you want? And asking visitors, well, what do you want? And bringing everybody together. It's a, there's a, there's a, um, the, the fault lies partly in, in, in the modern um, trend toward um, specialization. We don't have Renaissance people anymore, like, uh, you know, poets who are also uh, paleontologists and 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 doctors were the same. You know, one person. People have specialized, and um, I'm not calling myself a Renaissance man because that would be unhumble of me, but that would be arrogant of me. But I have a diploma which had uh, three years of of scientific studies uh, in environment, uh, chemistry, botany. And I haven't used that diploma in any other way except uh, diploma in horticulture, except to uh, interpret scientific stuff for the layperson. And it needs the, the world needs more people who can do that with the scientific background to be able to turn it into English, because science is probably the one language which everybody needs to read and understand, and nobody does. And we need that. Desperately, we need more people doing what I do on a much bigger scale. And George Monbiot put it very cleverly in, 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 a, in, in one of his pieces, which we read earlier this week, or which was quoted earlier this week. The problem is we're, we're talking about the environment. We're talking about these, uh, uh, we're using these jargon style, this jargon style language. Instead of talking the language of the lay person, it's not the environment. It's the landscape we live in. And um, you know, the, the test, the test is going to come down to how we how we create the conversion experiences to make the change.
Yeah. It all comes down to converting the talk into an experience that, that people enjoy during the leisure, that they're willing to pay the price of a ticket from the States to an area to engage with what they enjoy doing and engage with it in such a way that they come out a richer person. Um, whether that be cycling trails, I mean, South Africa and many places in the States have got something in common with their cyclists, their mountain bikers. You have got amazing trails in the States in variety of places. I've used them as models. And there's an, uh, you know, you, you can cycle through our environment. You can cycle through the space where it, wild elephants live where there's no fence, you can cycle there safely. And where, you know, everything we've spoken about tonight, um, where, where there's the opportunity to convert and make yourself uh, wiser for, for the experience. But how do we, the, the, the whole challenge becomes um, a, an economic challenge when it's just easier to, to sell the experience where you're looking at a lion in a cage or you're petting a cub, it's just so much easier to do that. It, the, the economic conversion is a no-brainer. The economic version to go on the moonlight meander with Judy Dixon is, is a little bit more of a challenge. And I think that's the crux of it, Martin, um, when, when you've got the, a group of people that where the critical mass um, overrides the, the easy way out is the day that we will start making a difference. Just to explain, explain to, to Ron, Judy Dixon is a, a local um, wildlife enthusiast who takes people on um, moonlight walks along the coast. Relatively small groups. I'm not sure what the size is. Perhaps, Greg, you know. But eight. Eight Ten. people at a time. So now, you've got that or you've got the mass tourism experiences where you've got thousands of people walking through a zoo. When you have thousands of Judy Dixons, the zoo will become redundant. I want to thank you both for your time, and I want to find a way of getting out of this conversation while leaving people wanting more and leaving us wanting to talk about more. But uh, honestly, we could I'd be happy to chat for the next three hours and pound something out. But uh, we'll connect, uh, uh, we'll, we'll confirm a time and connect again. And I want to give you a chance to say any final words. Go, yeah, Martin. <laughs> I was going to say, Greg, I, I, I don't want any responsibility. <laughs> but I think that's the point. <laughs> each one of us needs to take responsibility because each one of us is, the, is, the, is going to make that, uh, that, that be the butterfly that, that makes that effect that will turn into the typhoon. With three tonight, if we can be 300 in a year's time, it's where we want to go. Yeah, um, Ron, again, um, it's my second experience uh, hanging out, and um, I, I'm going to continue with my theme, uh, my mantra, or whatever you want to call it. I'm going to continually push the standards, the benchmark that I'm witnessing in its current format, um, which people are calling responsible tourism and responsible travel, and I'm going to try and and get people to relook at the foundations of their of and the basics of their conversation, and um, and I think that any person entering into tourism should it should be mandatory for them to understand the, the basics, and we have to create a groundswell that doesn't settle for anything less than good quality responsible tourism experiences. Beautiful. Well, thank you both for your time and for such passionate uh, insights into local conservation and local tourism. I certainly agree uh, with your sentiments and congratulations to the folks in Mossel Bay for preparing their event for late May and we will continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.